Thank you, Mitch. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, before I get into the sermon, I do want to mention this morning uh, the prayer promise that we started a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we will do that again today if you are interested in continuing on that prayer promise. If you weren't here a couple of weeks ago, what we did is everyone that was interested put their name on a little sheet of paper, and I have some paper up here in a little basket. Uh, put your name on there, and then draw another name out, and, and you're, you're promising to pray for that person at least once a day for the upcoming week. So those of you that want to participate in that again, we will do that. Please just come up after, uh, after we have uh, finished the service out this morning, and we'll continue with that prayer promise today. I got to admit, I'm kind of a sucker for buying books. <laughs> oh, no, not no. I, it's true. No. When someone recommends a book to me that seems kind of interesting, I'm usually on Amazon within about 12 seconds checking it out and <laughs> spending money on it. A couple of weeks ago, someone had recommended to me the Life Application Study Bible. If you guys uh, are looking for a good study Bible, I would recommend that one to you as well. Uh, it has all of the uh, references back and forth, and it also has a running commentary throughout the, throughout the Bible, and it's a really, really good one to look at. And I mention that because of uh, something that I came across in that commentary that I'll talk about here in just a minute. But I want to talk today a little bit about Jesus calling to Peter, come follow me. And when we look in Matthew and we look in Mark, it's basically Jesus kind of walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee and he comes up to, G to, to Peter, excuse me, and he sees him and he goes, come, follow me. So Peter goes and follows him. And as you read on, if you look in the, the Gospel of Luke, it's a little bit different story compared to Matthew and Mark. And in the commentary in the Life Application Study Bible, it suggests that this is the second time that Jesus calls to Peter, come follow me. And it makes a little bit of sense when you think about it that way. That Jesus called to them, they followed him for a little bit, then they went back to fishing, and then Jesus called them again. You guys ever had a bad day at work? <laughs> Nobody? No. Nobody's ever had a bad day at work. All the machines are breaking down around you. Stuff just isn't working right. The boss is just angry at you because of something that happened at home. The computers are down, so things just aren't going right. I worked emergency dispatch for about five years. When the computers go down in emergency dispatch, those are the days you want to walk away from the job, believe me. On the worst day that you had... If someone had come up to you and said, come, let's go, let's get out of here, do you think you might have gone with them oh, yeah. that oh, yeah. day? Oh, yeah. So you can kind of relate to this. And we look at this, and I'm kind of wondering if maybe that's what happened with Peter and Andrew and James and John that first time Jesus came along. They saw, they saw something special in Jesus. But maybe they didn't catch anything that night, and they said, well, this just this isn't working we got to go do something else. This guy seems nice. Let's, let's follow him. But then a few days go by, and you walked away from your job, and rent is due, cable bills due, car payments due. And you start to think, boy, I really shouldn't have done that. So you go back to your job, and that's, that's what Peter did. He went back fishing again. So they followed Jesus a little bit. But they didn't totally leave their lives behind at that point. So then we come to the scripture that, we, that Mitch read for us this morning in Luke chapter 5. Jesus is back at the Sea of Galilee. And Peter's there. They're still following him a little bit. They're keeping an eye on him. And Jesus is there and he's preaching. And he's talking to people. He's talking to a lot of people. And they're crowding around him and they're just... They're having a good time. The people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. So what does Jesus do? He hops in Peter's boat and tells Peter, Hey, can you set out from shore a little ways so I can get a better look at everybody and talk to them a little bit? Same reason we have this pulpit that's maybe a foot up off the ground. It's not that high up, but you can see me and I can see you and it works just fine. He needed just that little bit of distance. So he did that, and then when he was finished talking to the people, we're told, 
in verse 4 of Luke chapter 5. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Verse 5, Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. I'm going to read that verse with a little different inflection. And I think Mitch did a pretty good job with this one. But I'm going to read this with my own exaggerated inflection. Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. I think Peter's looking back at this. Peter knows better than Jesus here, doesn't he? Peter's looking at him like, okay, Jesus, okay, rabbi, I'll go fishing. The fishermen will listen to you, carpenter, I'll, but I'll go out because you said so. I think Peter's trying to prove Jesus wrong here, but he tries to prove him wrong. So what does he do? He sets out and he lets down the nets. Let me ask you a question. How often are we like Peter here? Don't ask my husband. I'm not necessarily talking about to each other. I'm talking about to Jesus. We know more than Jesus oftentimes. How often do we tell Jesus, Jesus, I know more than you do? We do. We might not think that we do all that often. But there's a phrase that I've heard, I know I've said it, I know I've heard people in here say it, I know I've heard Christians say it all over the place. And once I realized what I was saying when I said it, it really convicted me. And honestly, I'm hoping to convict some people this morning with what this statement is. Have you ever said the phrase, I know I'm a Christian, but... And then finish that statement? Maybe, I know Jesus said, but... I know the Bible says... But, what are you saying when you make that statement? You're standing there, you're saying, you know more than God. I know God, but I live in the real world. It doesn't really work that way today. I don't expect anybody to instantly change saying that. You're going to still say that. I guarantee you're going to catch yourself saying that one of these days. And that's all right. But I want you to catch yourself when you say that. You're standing around a group of your friends. You go, well, you know, I know I'm a Christian, but wait a minute. I remember what Pastor Mike said on Sunday. Your friends are probably going to look at you a little funny. Yeah, I know you're a Christian. You know you're a Christian, but finish your sentence. But you know what? No. What I was going to say isn't right. I know it's wrong. That's why I said it that way. So what I want to try and encourage you to do this morning and as we go forward, change that to a so phrase. Instead of, I know I'm a Christian, but, change it to, I know I'm a Christian, so. I know I'm a Christian, so I'm going to volunteer at a homeless shelter. I know I'm a Christian, so I'm going to volunteer at church. I know I'm a Christian, so I'm going to donate to missions. I know I'm a Christian, so I'm going to go on a mission. I know I'm a Christian, so I'm going to tell my neighbor about Jesus Christ. If I can go off on a slight tangent here concerning missions, something I would love to see us do as a church is some missions, short-term mission trips, long-term mission trips. If one of you wants to become a full-time missionary, awesome. Let's get that together. I think a lot of you know my dad. Whenever I mention anything about a mission to him, his face lights up because probably about 10, 12, 15 years ago, he did a mission trip down to Mississippi, I believe it was, right after Hurricane Katrina. And you can't talk to him about anything like that without him just getting this big smile on his face because he knows he helped people. He knows he helped people in the name of God. I'm guessing if I asked Kate, she would say the same exact thing with her trip to the Philippines. It's incredibly rewarding. It rewards the people that you help and it also rewards you and encourages you to continue on. So let's get back to our scripture here a little bit. So Peter just cast down the nets to try to prove Jesus wrong. There's no fish out there, Jesus. So what happens next? He doesn't catch anything, right? 
He must not, because Peter's the fisherman. Peter's right. Continuing in verse 6. When they had done so, when they let down the nets, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. Jesus didn't just know they were going to catch a few fish. They caught so many fish that Peter said weren't there. They nearly sank two boats with all those fish. So who was right, Peter or Jesus? That's right, Jesus was right. Very good. So what was Peter's reaction to this? Peter's like, all right, fine, whatever. No. When Simon Peter saw this in verse 8, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. He realized something about Jesus. He realized, I might be the fisherman, but Jesus knows a little bit more than I do here. Peter realizes that he's wrong. And it's kind of tough for us a lot of times to come to that realization that we're wrong. But it's something that we need to do, especially when it comes to what's in this book. But Jesus turned and said to Simon, said to Peter, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. From here on now, they are following Jesus. They left everything behind. Absolutely everything behind. They left their boats. They left their livelihood behind. We too need to leave everything behind when we come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to leave our former selves behind. I struggle with that. I still listen to heavy metal and things like that. There's a lot of not good Jesus music in Black Sabbath. It's true. We need to leave our sins behind. Jesus has forgiven us. God has forgiven us through Jesus Christ, through the sacrifice of his son. We need to leave our failures behind. If you're anything like me, I'm kind of introverted. My brain is a little weird. So whenever things come up, I always remember weird things from like 20 years ago. It's like, why did I say that dumb thing to the Blockbuster clerk that one time? It still comes up in my head. I think most importantly, we need to leave behind our belief that we can do things on our own. We need to put our faith in Christ. So Peter had an incredible awakening with this, didn't he? This miraculous catch of fish. So when Peter saw this, he never questioned Jesus again, right? I wouldn't ask that question if I wasn't going to go somewhere with that one, would I? If you'd like to follow along in your pew Bibles, I will give you some page numbers here. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14, starting in verse 25, it's on page 1524. Starting on page 1524 of your pew Bible, if you'd like to follow along. This is where Jesus is walking on the water. So Jesus told his disciples, get in the boat and cross the lake. He's like, okay. It was kind of stormy, so I'm sure they were a little bit nervous at that point. But they get in there, and they start crossing. And we're told, shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come out, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, Why do you doubt? I know I've taken that journey out of the boat a few times. You start to kind of do that little step and you back off a little bit. Yeah. Well, Peter jumped, man. Peter was, <coughs> he was ready to go. He was in the water. But then he took his focus off of Jesus at that point. That's when he started to sink. We have to keep our focus on Jesus as well. Otherwise, we too will sink. The path that Christ has us on 
requires us to maintain our focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. So that must have been a good a good demonstration. Peter was pretty happy with that one, right? So I was like, all right, well, Jesus showed me I can walk on the water if I trust in him. I didn't trust in him. I started to sink and then he saved me. Yeah. So that must have been the end of it. He just followed Jesus. Gospel of John, chapter 13, page 1673 of your pew Bible. This is before the Lord's Supper, which we will be joining together this morning to remember. At that time, it was very dirty. There wasn't concrete roads. It was dirt roads, and I'm guessing it was a little muddy. At the time, I haven't done a great study on first century Jerusalem, but it was muddy. So the, the custom was for one of the servants to wash the feet of people before they would have a meal. Well, there was no servant before this Passover feast that they were about to have. So Jesus decided he was going to do it. And we read starting in verse 6 of chapter 13. He, Jesus, came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, Not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, Those who have had a bath need only wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. Jesus is doing this incredible thing for his disciples. Peter just doesn't quite get it at this point. Jesus comes to him, Peter, I'm going to wash your feet. No, no, Jesus, you're not going to do that. Peter, trust me, I got to do this. Okay, fine. If you're going to do that, wash my hands and my head as well. He's giving orders to Jesus at this point. By the way, this is a really wonderful bit of scripture for Christian leadership. If you're in a Christian leadership position or any leadership position in terms of serving those that you lead, it's a wonderful visual to get down and to wash the feet of those who generally would be serving you, but you need to show them that you are serving them. So this must have been where Peter figures it out. But if we turn into the Gospel of Mark, page 1543 of your pew Bible, Mark 14, starting in verse 27, this is after the Lord's Supper. You will all fall away, Jesus told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. Truly, I tell you, Jesus answered today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. Still, Peter is questioning Jesus, saying, Jesus, you're wrong. I'm not going to leave you. You think you, you know me, but you don't. I won't leave you. We're given another story that I'll just reference here where they're in the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus is captured. And Peter takes out his sword and he cuts off the ear of the high priest's servant. I bet Peter was feeling pretty good at that point. Like, see, Jesus told you I was going to defend you the whole way. How could you doubt me, Jesus? But then we find out in the Gospel of John, chapter 18, starting on page 1681 of your pew Bible. This is after Jesus had been captured. Simon Peter and another disciple were following Jesus. Because this disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard. But Peter had to wait outside at the door. The other disciple who was known to the high priest came back, spoke to the servant girl on duty there, and brought Peter in. 
You aren't one of this man's disciples too, are you? She asked Peter. He replied, I am not. A little bit later on, starting in verse 25. Meanwhile, Simon Peter was still standing there warming himself. So they asked him, you aren't one of his disciples too, are you? He denied it, saying, I am not. One of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him, didn't I see you with him in the garden? Again, Peter denied it, and at that moment, a rooster began to crow. One of the other gospels says, Peter cursed at him and denied it. Did Peter get it yet? He's had all these chances to figure it out, and now Jesus has been captured. And everything Jesus said was going to happen is happening. Do you think Peter would ever question Jesus again? Well, after Christ was crucified and buried and was resurrected, we find Peter and some of the other disciples back fishing. Also in the Gospel of John, chapter 21, starting verse 15, starting on page 1687 of your pew Bible. When they had finished eating, after they were fishing, they sat down and had a little meal. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Jesus, why do you keep asking me this? Do I really have to keep proving this to you? I already told you I love you. Peter is still questioning Jesus here. I see an awful lot of Simon Peter in me in questioning my path some days. I think there's a lot of Simon Peter in absolutely all of us that we sit there and we say, I know more than you, Jesus. I know I'm a Christian, but... Are we still trying to do this on our own? Anybody still trying to do this all on your own? We need to turn that over to God. I want you to do something here with me this morning briefly before we prepare for communion. In your bulletin, you should have your announcement sheet here. And on the back, it should be blank. I want you to take that out for me, if you would, please. There should be a pencil in front of you. If there's not a pencil in front of you, there should be one fairly close by. Or if you have a pen or anything else, we're going to write something down real quick. And on that sheet that you have, I want you to write this at the top. I know I'm a Christian, comma, but dot, dot, dot. Go ahead and write that down. Right now. Everybody get that written down? Close? Once you're done with that, on that sheet of paper with that same pencil, I want you to cross out the butt. And write so. Go ahead and cross out the butt right under that so. What I want you to do with this over the upcoming week is when you get home today, I want you to put this on your fridge. Right, smack it out on your fridge. If you're anything like me, you make a couple trips to the fridge a day. <laughs> and as the week goes by, I want you to write on this what you can do because you're a Christian. I know I'm a Christian, so I'm going to tell my neighbor about Jesus Christ today. I know I'm a Christian, so when the church gets a mission trip together, I'm going to do it. I'm going to go on. 
Now, I'm not going to ask you to bring this in next Sunday if you don't want to. If you want to, bring it in and tell everybody what you did throughout the course of the week. Become a so Christian, not a but Christian. One last thing I want to say before we sing our communion hymn this morning. As we prepare ourselves this morning for joining together in the Lord's table, I would like to encourage you to follow this instruction that Paul gives us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. Ask yourself this morning as we prepare, am I a but Christian or am I a so Christian? Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us this time together. Thank you for teaching us through Peter that we need to keep our focus on you, that we need to keep our trust in you, Lord. Father, be with us today. Help us to see our faults, our flaws, our sins, that we may bring them to you and that we may leave them at this table today. Father, we ask these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.